Welcome everyone. In this video, I want to cover graphs again. So this is part two of the previous video. This time around, we are going to focus on the graphs which have all different shapes and sizes. And there are a lot of graphs to cover. These are the graphs that you should remember before sitting for your exam. So you should know their shapes. You should know what is on the y-axis, what is on the x-axis, what uh, is the gradient of the line representing and how each of those two quantities on x and y-axis are related to each other. And if there is a related equation to that graph, you should also know that. So what I'll do is I'll cover all of these graphs very quickly. I'll just spend five to 10 seconds on each graph trying to give a quick overview of each graph and then you should go back to your notes and look at them properly if you have missed out on anything. All right, so let's get started. The first graph is from gravitational fields. This shows the relationship between gravitational field strength on the y-axis and the distance from the center of the mass on the x-axis. Now you can ignore the part which is below the dot, um, which is before the dotted line that is for inside the planet that is not part of the A-level syllabus but the graph that is outside the planet shows the inverse square relationship between G and R. So G is inversely proportional to the square of R. If R doubles G decreases by a factor of 4. If R triples G decreases by a factor of 9. Second graph is gravitational field strength between two different planets. So it shows the, how the gravitational field strength varies from the surface of the first planet to the surface of the second planet. What this tells you is that the gravitational field strength have different directions of both the planets and there is a point between two planets where, where the gravitational field strength of both planets is equal to each other. So the overall gravitational field strength becomes equal to zero and that's where the graph crosses the x-axis line. It is also clear from this graph that the gravitational field strength on the surface of the planet 1 is much stronger compared to the uh, compared to the gravitational field strength on the surface of planet 2 all right this is the graph of gravitational potential versus the distance from the surface of the planet or from any mass it could be any star it could be moon it could be a planet it could be anything again Another thing to note here, notice here is that the gravitational potential is always going to be negative. So the graph is always below the x-axis. It never goes above the x-axis. All the values are negative. It does not show an inverse square relationship like gravitational field strength. It shows an inverse relationship between um, the potential and r. So if r doubles, 5 will become half. If r triples, 5 will also divide by a factor of 3. This graph shows the relationship between gravitational potential and distance from one of the planets and it shows the overall value of uh, gravitational potential between the two planets so how does it vary and first thing to notice is that the value always remains below x-axis so the values are all negative and uh, then this is the point where the gradient of the graph becomes equal to zero and where the gradient of the graph become equals to zero you should remember that the strength of the gravitational field becomes equals to zero as well. So the gradient of this graph is actually related to the value of this graph. All right. This graph is from simple harmonic motion. It shows you the displacement time graph, which is a sinusoidal graph. So it has, it has an equation of sine and it shows the case where the mass is at zero displacement when time was started, when time was equal to zero. From here, you can find the frequency, you can find the period, you can find the amplitude. You can also find uh, the angular frequency and other stuff related to simple harmonic motion. The, this graph is related to the previous graph as this shows the rate of change of displacement. So this is a velocity time graph. This has a shape of a cosine graph and the velocity is maximum in the beginning. And then again, it varies sinusoidally the related equations are mentioned on the side. Again, you can find the period, maximum velocity, frequency, angular frequency, all of that from here. This is the graph of velocity and displacement in simple harmonic motion. So when what this graph tells you is that when displacement is maximum, then velocity is going to be zero. And when displacement is zero, the velocity is going to be maximum on either side. So this graph is actually a shape of a circle. This is the graph between acceleration and displacement in simple harmonic motion and it, sh it basically proves uh, if some motion is simple harmonic motion or not. Uh, it is a straight line graph, it passes through a region so that shows that acceleration is proportional to displacement. Another thing is the negative gradient of the graph. The negative gradient shows 
that the acceleration and displacement are opposite to each other all right another graph from, from simple harmonic motion this graph shows the kinetic energy the potential energy and total energy how these how each of these types of energies vary with displacement during simple harmonic motion this graph is again showing kinetic energy potential energy and total energy but this time the variation is shown with respect to time this graph shows <clears throat> what the graph of displacement time graph will look like if damping occurs in a simple harmonic motion system this graph compares two types of damping so the blue graph represents light damping where it's much more gradual whereas in the red graph the displacement decreases much more quickly which means that it shows heavy damping all right this graph again rep uh, represents three different types of uh, damping the graph which is the red one shows a system which is under damped so it will go some oscillations before coming to rest the graph which shows critical damping represents a situation where the mass will come to rest without performing any oscillations in the shortest possible time and then the blue graph shows over damping so you have increased damping even more than critical damping and that is this this graph shows the phenomena of resonance resonance occurs when the amplitude is maximum and this happens when the driving frequency of the oscillator becomes equal to the natural frequency of the free oscillations this graph shows how resonance is affected by the damping on the system if you increase the damping the peak moves slightly to the left and also becomes shallower and flatter each time this graph is for an ideal gas which shows the relationship between pressure and volume if all other things for example the mass of the gas the number of moles and temperature and other things remain constant then the pressure and volume are inversely proportional to each other so if volume doubles pressure is going to half if volume triples the pressure is going to divide by a factor of three this graph shows the relationship between pressure and volume again but this time we have a reciprocal of volume on the x-axis so the graph becomes a straight line graph crossing through origin this graph shows the relationship between pressure and temperature if all other stuff like volume and mass are constant then pressure and temperature are directly proportional to each other this graph shows that volume and temperature are directly proportional to each other for an ideal gas if pressure and mass of the gas are constant this graph shows you the relationship between temperature and the product of pressure and volume however the scale of this graph is in degree celsius that's why the graphs do not pass through origin in fact they touch the x-axis at absolute zero which is minus two uh, which is minus 273.15 however we can draw the same graph with the kelvin scale and this time the graphs of all the different gases with different situations and different masses will have a similar shape and they will all meet at 0, 0, which is 0 kelvins in the Kelvin scale, the absolute zero. This graph shows how the resistance of a metallic wire changes with temperature. This graph shows how the resistance of a thermistor changes with temperature. This graph shows how the EMF in a thermocouple thermometer is produced versus the difference in temperature in two junctions this graph shows the heating curve of a substance as it starts from a solid and then you keep heating it then it melts during melting temperature does not change and then the liquid uh, starts to heat up as well so temperature rises and then it boils and during boiling the temperature also does not change and then it turns into a gas and again the temperature starts to rise the gradients in the solid liquid and the gas part uh, basically represent the relative specific heat capacities in each state the steeper the gradient the less the specific heat capacity of the substance is going to be in that state this graph is from electric fields it shows you the electric field strength of a sphere which can be assumed to be a point charge and <clears throat> inside the sphere the electric field strength is zero outside the sphere it has a relationship of e is proportional to 1 over r square this graph shows the relationship of electric potential versus the distance from the center of a charged sphere inside the sphere the value of v is maximum and always constant and outside the sphere v is inversely proportional to r this this graph shows how voltage or potential difference across a capacitor and the charge on it vary with each other and the area under the graph shows you the energy stored by the capacitor this graph however 
is for the same circuit but this graph is not for the capacitor but the battery which is charging up the capacitor. Since the EMF of the battery remains constant, the graph is just a straight line and does not have any gradient at all. So <clears throat> the energy spent by the battery is actually double than the energy stored by the capacitor. The rest of the energy is wasted as heat due to the resistance of the wire and the rest of the circuit. Okay, this graph shows shows you what the graph of alternating voltage or alternating current looks like before it has been rectified. This graph shows you what that same voltage looks like after half wave rectification. This graph shows you what happens to the graph after the half wave rectified current has been smoothed out using a capacitor. This graph shows you the same alternating current if you apply full wave rectification to it. This graph shows you what the graph will look like after you apply smoothing to full wave rectification. This is a graph from quantum physics and it's related to photoelectric emission. This tells you the relationship between the kinetic energy maximum of the photoelectrons versus the frequency of the arriving photons. The x-intercept of the graph gives you the threshold frequency and the gradient of this graph will be equal to the Planck constant. This graph is a pretty similar graph related to the previous one but this time instead of having frequency on the x-axis we have 1 over lambda on the x-axis the graph will give you the same shape however the gradient this time is equal to Planck constant multiplied by speed of light and the x-intercept is not equal to threshold frequency but it's equal to 1 over threshold wavelength this graph is from nuclear physics and it gives you the relationship between the binding energy per nucleon versus the nucleon number of all the elements in the periodic table. You should remember the shape of the graph and you should know some important points about the graph. Point A represents nuclei which have very small um, nucleon number like hydrogen, helium and stuff. Uh, nuclei between point A and B will undergo fusion. Point B represents the most stable nuclei which is iron and it has a mass number or a nucleon number of 56. It has the highest binding energy per nucleon. Point C represents uh, the nuclei uh, which are built, uh, the most heaviest in the periodic table like uranium, thorium and plutonium etc. These nuclei have again decreasing binding energy as they get heavier and heavier. The nuclei that exist on this graph between point B and point C will basically split and uh, undergo nuclear fission and produce two lighter nuclei but they will all be on the right side of point B. All right. This graph represents uh, what happens when a radioactive material undergoes radioactive decay. From here you can find the half-life of the sample. The fluctuations in the readings, the points that are scattered across the line show you that the radiation or radioactivity is a random process. Uh, one more thing is that this graph is uh, known as the exponential shape. So this is representing an exponential decay. Okay, this graph represents the spectrum of the X-ray that is produced <coughs> when a metal target is hit by decelerating electrons. The spikes on the graphs are characteristic of the metal which is hit by the uh, electrons to produce X-rays. So they basically are corresponding to the emission spectrum of the metal, whereas the sharp cutoff here which where the line meets the x-axis represents the shortest wavelength of the x-rays that will be released. Now the shorter the wavelength, the higher the uh, energy of the x-rays. So th this wavelength represents the highest energy x-ray that can be released where all of the energy of the electron is converted into all of the energy of the x-ray photon. This graph represents Amplitude modulation. The first graph shows you the unmodulated carrier wave. The second graph shows you the information signal which according to which the modulator wave have to be uh, modulated and then the third graph shows you what the carrier wave will look like after amplitude modulation. So this is AM. This graph represents what happens during frequency modulation. First graph is the unmodulated carrier wave. The second graph is your information signal. And the third graph shows you how frequency varies in synchrony with the displacement of the information signal. So this graph shows you the frequency of the carrier wave and the sidebands and the bandwidth of a carrier wave after it has been 
amplitude modulated uh, by an information signal of a single frequency on top of it. This graph shows you pretty much the same thing but this time the information signal that has been used to the amplitude modulation on the carrier wave is not of a single frequency but has a bunch of different frequencies and you can find the maximum frequency of the information signal from here and you can also find the bandwidth of the informa information signal from here from these widths and the entire width will give you the bandwidth this center gives you the frequency of the carrier wave all right